Little Match Girl. It was dreadfully cold, it was snowing fast, and almost dark. The evening, the last evening of the old year, was drawing in. But cold and dark as it was, a poor little girl, with bare head and feet, was still wandering about the streets. When she left her home she had slippers on, but they were much too large for her. Indeed, really, they belonged to her mother, and had dropped off her feet while she was running very fast across the road, to get out of the way of two carriages. One of the slippers was not to be found, the other had been snatched up by a little boy, who ran off with it thinking it might serve him as a doll's cradle. So, the little girl now walked on, with her bare feet quite red and blue with the cold. She carried a small bundle of matches in her hand, and a good many more in her tattered apron. No one had bought any of them the live long day, no one had given her a single penny. Trembling with cold and hunger she crept on, the picture of sorrow, poor little child. The snowflakes fell on her long fair hair, which curled in such pretty ringlets over her shoulders, but she thought not of her own beauty, nor of the cold. Lights were glimmering through every window, and the savor of roast goose reached her from several houses. It was New Year's Eve, and it was of this that she thought. In a corner formed by two houses, one of which projected beyond the other, she sat down, drawing her little feet close under her, but in vain, she could not warm them. She dared not go home, she had sold no matches, and earned not a single penny. Besides her home was almost as cold as the street, it was an attic, and although the larger of the many chinks in the roof were stopped up with straw and rags, the wind and snow often came through. She drew one match out and struck it against the wall. But it didn't flame up. Her hands were nearly dead with cold. One little match from her bundle would warm them, perhaps. She drew one out and struck it against the wall. It flamed up. It was a bright, warm flame, and she held her hands over it. It was quite an illumination for that poor little girl, no, call it rather a magic taper, for it seemed to her as though she were sitting before a large iron stove with brass ornaments, so beautifully blazed the fire within. The child stretched out her feet to warm them also. Oh no! In an instant the flame had died away, the stove vanished, the little girl sat cold and comfortless, with the burnt match in her hand. A second match was struck against the wall. It kindled and blazed, and wherever its light fell the wall became transparent as a veil, the little girl could see into the room within. She saw the table spread with a snow-white damask cloth, whereon were ranged shining china dishes, the roast goose, stuffed with apples and dried plums, stood at one end, smoking hot, and, which was pleasantest of all to see the goose, with knife and fork still in her breast, jumped down from the dish, and waddled along the floor right up to the poor child. Then the match went out, and only the thick hard wall was beside her. She kindled a third match. Again up shot the flame. And now she was sitting under a most beautiful Christmas tree, far larger, and far more prettily decked out, than the one she had seen last Christmas Eve through the glass doors of the rich merchant's house. Hundreds of wax tapers lighted up the green branches, and tiny painted figures, such as she had seen in the shop windows, looked down from the tree upon her. The child stretched out her hands towards them in delight, and in that moment the light of the match was quenched. Still, however, the Christmas candles burned higher and higher, she beheld them beaming like stars in heaven. One of them fell, the light streaming behind it like a long, fiery tail. The goose jumped down from the dish and waddled along the floor right up to the poor child. Now someone is dying, said the little girl softly, for she had been told by her old grandmother, the only person who had ever been kind to her, and who was now dead, 
that whenever a star falls an immortal spirit returns to God who gave it. She struck yet another match against the wall. It flamed up, and, surrounded by its light, appeared before her that same dear grandmother, gentle and loving as always, but bright and happy as she had never looked during her lifetime. Grandmother, exclaimed the child. Oh, take me with you. I know you will leave me as soon as the match goes out. You will vanish like the warm fire in the stove, like the splendid New Year's feast, like the beautiful large Christmas tree. And she hastily lighted all the remaining matches in the bundle, lest her grandmother should disappear. And the matches burned with such a blaze of splendor, that noonday could scarcely have been brighter. Never had the good old grandmother looked so tall and stately, so beautiful and kind. She took the little girl in her arms, and they both flew together, joyfully and gloriously they flew, higher and higher, till they were in that place where neither cold, nor hunger, nor pain is ever known, they were in paradise. But in the cold morning hour, crouching in the corner of the wall, the poor little girl was found, her cheeks glowing, her lips smiling, frozen to death on the last night of the old year. The new year sun shone on the lifeless child. Motionless she sat there with the matches in her lap, one bundle of them quite burned out. She has been trying to warm herself, poor thing, the people said, but no one knew of the sweet vision she had beheld, or how gloriously she and her grandmother were celebrating their New Year's festival. The Little Red Riding Hood Once upon a time there lived a little girl, who was so sweet, and pretty, and good, that everybody loved her. Her old grandmother, who was very fond of her, made her a little red cloak and hood which suited her so well that everyone called her Little Red Riding Hood. One day, Little Red Riding Hood's mother told her to take a basket with some butter and eggs and fresh baked cake to her grandmother who was ill. The little girl, who was always willing and obliging, ran at once to fetch her red cloak and taking her basket, and set out on her journey. On her way, she met a wolf, who wished very much to eat her up but who dared not do so because some woodcutters were working close by. So he only said, Good morning, Little Red Riding Hood, where are you off to so early? Little Red Riding Hood, who did not know how dangerous it was to talk to a wolf, replied, I am going to see my grandmother, who is ill in bed, to take her some butter and eggs and a fresh baked cake that my mother has made for her. Where does your grandmother live? asked the wolf. In the little white cottage at the other side of the wood. Answered Red Riding Hood. Well? Said the wolf. I am going that way too. If you will let me, I will walk part of the way with you. So Little Red Riding Hood, who suspected no harm, set off with the wolf for her companion. When Red Riding Hood stopped to gather wild flowers for her grandmother, and the wolf, who had thought of a plan to get the little girl for his dinner, quietly left her and trotted away. As soon as he was out of sight, he began to run as fast as he could. In a short time, he reached the grandmother's cottage and knocked at the door. Who is there? Asked the old grandmother, as she lay in bed. It is Little Red Riding Hood. Answered the wolf. I have brought you some butter and eggs and a fresh baked cake which mother has made for you. Pull the bobbin and the latch will go up. Said the old grandmother. So the wolf pulled the bobbin and opened the door, and sprang upon the poor old grandmother and ate her all up in a twinkling. Then he put on her nightcap and got into bed and lay down to wait for Red Riding Hood. Very soon, there came a little soft tap at the door. Who is there? Called out the wolf. It is Little Red Riding Hood, dear grandmother. 
I have brought you some butter and eggs and a fresh baked cake which mother has made for you. Then the wolf called out, disguising his voice as much as he could. Pull the bobbin, and the latch will go up. So Little Red Riding Hood pulled the bobbin and went inside. Good morning dear grandmother, how are you feeling today? She said. Very bad indeed, my dear. Answered the wolf, trying to hide himself under the bedclothes. How strange and hoarse your voice sounds dear grandmother. Said the little girl. I have got a bad cold, my dear. Said the wicked wolf. Grandmother, what very bright eyes you have. Went on Red Riding Hood, surprised to see how strange her grandmother looked in her nightclothes. The better to see you with, my dear. Said the wolf. Grandmother, what very big ears you have. The better to hear you with, my child. Grandmother, what very long arms you have. The better to hug you with, my dear. But grandmother, what great big teeth you have. Said Red Riding Hood, who was beginning to get frightened. The better to eat you with roared the wolf, suddenly jumping out of bed. He seized old of poor little Red Riding Hood, and was just about to eat her up, when there was a great noise outside, and the door burst open and in rushed the woodcutters, who had seen the wolf talking to the little girl in the wood, and came to see what mischief he was up to. They killed the wicked wolf, and so little Red Riding Hood was saved, and ran home to tell her mother all about her terrible adventure. The Three Bears There were once three bears who lived together in a little house in the middle of a wood. One of them was a little small wee bear, one was a middle-sized bear, and the other was a great huge bear. And they each had a pot to eat their porridge from. A little pot for the little small wee bear, a middle-sized pot for the middle-sized bear, and a great big pot for the great huge bear and they each had a chair to sit on, a little chair for the little small wee bear, a middle-sized chair for the middle-sized bear, and a great big chair for the great huge bear. And they each had a bed to sleep in, a little bed for the little small wee bear, a middle-sized bed for the middle-sized bear, and a great big bed for the great huge bear. One day they made the porridge for their breakfast, and poured it into their porridge pots, and then went out in the wood for a walk while the porridge for their breakfast was cooling. And while they were out walking, a little old woman came to the house in the wood, and peeped inside. First, she peeped through the keyhole, then she peeped through the window. Then she lifted the latch and peeped through the doorway, and seeing nobody in the house, she walked in. And when she saw the porridge cooling on the table, she was very pleased, for she had walked a long way, and was getting hungry. So first she tasted the porridge of the great huge bear, but that was too hot. Then she tasted the porridge of the middle-sized bear, but that was too cold. And then, she tasted the porridge of the little small wee bear, and that was neither too hot nor too cold, but just right. And she liked it so much, that she ate it all up. Then the little old woman sat down in the chair of the great huge bear, but that was too hard. Then she sat down in the chair of the middle-sized bear, but that was too soft. Then she sat down in the chair of the little small wee bear, and that was neither too hard nor too soft, but just right. And she liked it so much, that she sat in it, until suddenly the bottom came out, and she fell down plump, upon the ground. Then the little old woman went upstairs into the bedroom, where the three bears slept. And first she lay down on the bed of the great huge bear, but that was too high at the head for her. Then she lay down on the bed of the middle-sized bear, but that was too high at the foot for her. So then she lay down on the bed of the little small wee bear, and that was neither too high at the head nor too high at the foot, but just right. And she liked it so much, that she covered herself up and lay there till she fell fast asleep. Soon the three bears came home to breakfast. 
Now the little old woman had left the spoon of the great huge bear standing in his porridge pot. Somebody has been at my porridge," said the great huge bear in his great rough gruff voice. And when the middle-sized bear looked, she saw that the spoon was standing in her porridge pot too. Somebody has been at my porridge," said the middle-sized bear in her middle-sized voice. Then the little small wee bear looked. And there was the spoon in his porridge pot, but the porridge was all gone. Somebody has been at my porridge and has eaten it all up," said the little small wee bear in his little small wee voice. Then the three bears began to look about them. Now the little old woman had not put the hard cushion straight after she had sat in the chair of the great huge bear. Somebody has been sitting in my chair," said the great huge bear. In his great rough gruff voice, and the little old woman had squashed the soft cushion of the middle-sized bear. Somebody has been sitting in my chair," said the middle-sized bear in her middle-sized voice. And you know what the little old woman had done to the third chair? Somebody has been sitting in my chair and has sat the bottom out," said the little small wee bear in his little small wee voice. Then the three bears went upstairs into their bedroom. Now the little old woman had pulled the pillow of the great huge bear out of its place. Somebody has been lying in my bed," said the great huge bear in his great rough gruff voice. And the little old woman had pulled the bolster of the middle-sized bear out of its place. Somebody has been lying in my bed," said the middle-sized bear in her middle-sized voice. And when the little small wee bear came to look at his bed, there was the bolster in its place and the pillow in its place upon the bolster. And upon the pillow was the little old woman's head, which was not in its place, for she had no business there at all. Somebody has been lying in my bed, and here she is! cried the little small wee bear in his little small wee voice. The little old woman had heard in her sleep the great rough gruff voice of the great huge bear. But she was so fast asleep that it seemed to her no more than the roaring of the wind or the rumbling of thunder. And she had heard the middle-sized voice of the middle-sized bear, but it was only as if she had heard someone speaking in a dream. But when she heard the little small wee voice of the little small wee bear, it was so sharp and shrill that it woke her up at once. Up she started when she saw the three bears on one side of the bed. She tumbled out at the other. Jumped out of the window and ran away through the wood to her own home, and the three bears never saw anything more of her. The Sleeping Beauty. Once upon a time, there lived a king and queen who had no children. They longed very much for a child, and when at last they had a little daughter, they were both delighted, and great rejoicings took place. When the time came for the little princess to be christened, the king made a grand feast and invited all, but one of the fairies in his kingdom to be godmothers. There happened to be thirteen fairies in the kingdom, but as the king had only twelve gold plates, he had to leave one of them out. The twelve fairies that were invited came to the christening and presented the little princess with the best gifts in their possession. One gave her beauty. One gave her wisdom, another grace, another goodness, until all but one had presented their offerings. Just as the last fairy was about to step forward and offer her gift, there came a tremendous knocking at the door, and before anybody could get there to open it, it was burst open, and in came the thirteenth fairy in a furious rage at not having been invited to the feast. When she saw all the gifts which the other fairies had presented the child, she laughed and exclaimed, "A lot of good all this beauty and virtue and wealth will do to you, my pretty princess. You shall pay for the slight your royal father has put upon me." Then, turning to the terrified king and queen, she said in a loud voice. When the princess is fifteen years old, she shall prick her finger with a spindle and die. Having said this, 
She flew away as noisily as she came. The king and queen were in despair, and the courtiers stood aghast at the terrible disaster. While the little princess began to cry piteously, as if she knew the fate in store for her, then the twelfth fairy stepped forward. Do not be afraid, she said. I have not yet given my gift. I cannot undo the wicked spell, but I can soften the evil. The princess, on her fifteenth birthday, shall prick her finger with a spindle, but she shall not die. Instead, she shall fall asleep for a hundred years. What comfort will that be to us? cried the queen. Long before the hundred years are past, we shall be dead. And our darling child will be as lost to us as if she were indeed to die. I can make that right," said the fairy. "When the princess falls asleep, you shall sleep too, and awaken with her when the hundred years are past." But the king still hoped to save his daughter from such a terrible misfortune. So he ordered all the spinning wheels in his kingdom to be burned or destroyed, and made a law that no one was to use one on pain of instant death. But all his care was useless. On her fifteenth birthday, the princess slipped away from her attendants and wandered all through the palace. At last, she came to a tower which she had never seen before, and wondering what it contained, she climbed the stairs. From a room at the top came a curious humming noise, and the princess, wondering what it could be, pushed open the door and stepped inside. There sat an old woman, bent with age, working at a strangely shaped wheel. The princess was full of curiosity. "What is that funny-looking thing?" she asked. "It is a spinning wheel, my princess." Answered the old woman, who was no other than the wicked fairy in disguise. A spinning wheel. What is that? I have never heard of such a thing. Said the princess. She stood watching for a few minutes, and then she added, "It looks quite easy. May I try to do it?" Certainly. Said the wicked fairy. And the princess sat down and tried to turn the wheel, but no sooner did she lay her hand upon it than the spindle, which was enchanted, pricked her finger, and the princess fell back against the silk-covered couch, fast asleep. In a moment, a deep silence fell upon all who were in the castle. The king fell asleep in the midst of his counselors, the queen with her ladies in waiting. The horses in the stable, the pigeons on the roof, the flies upon the walls, even the very fire upon the hearth fell asleep too. The meat which was cooking in the kitchen ceased to frizzle, and the cook, who was just about to box the kitchen boy's ears, fell asleep with her hand outstretched and began to snore aloud. The butler who was tasting the ale fell asleep with a jug at his lips. A great hedge sprang up around the castle, which, as the years passed on, grew and grew until it formed an impenetrable barrier around the sleeping palace. The old people of the country died, and their children grew up and died also, and their children, and their children, and the story of the sleeping princess became a legend, handed down from one generation to another, and a cloud of mystery as thick and impenetrable as the hedge of thorns. Lay over the old castle. Many brave and gallant princes tried to force their way through the magic hedge in order to solve the mystery and to see for themselves the beautiful maiden who lay in an enchanted sleep behind that thorny barrier. But the thorns caught them and held them from going forward or back, and the gallant youths perished miserably in the thickets. After many many years, there came a king's son into that country. Who heard the story of the princess and the hedge of briars, 
and he made up his mind to try and force his way to the castle to awake the sleeping princess. People told him of the fate of the other princes, who had also attempted this difficult task. But the prince would not be warned. I have made up my mind to see this maiden of whose beauty I have heard so many wonderful tales. He cried. I will force a way through the hedge of thorns, and awake the sleeping beauty, or die in the attempt. Now, it happened that this day was the last day of the hundred years. And when the prince came to the thicket that surrounded the castle, and began to push his way through, he found that the briars yielded readily to his touch. The thorns had all blossomed into roses that scented the air with fragrance, as he went by. Primroses sprang up before his feet and made a pathway to lead him straight to the castle gates. And the bird suddenly broke forth into singing, as if to tell the world that the hundred years of enchantment were over, and the princess about to be awakened from her long sleep. The prince passed through the council chamber, where the king and his counselors were sleeping, through the room where the queen and her ladies slept. He passed on from hall to hall, climbed from stair to stair, until at last he reached the tower chamber, where the sleeping princess lay. For a moment, he stood and gazed in wonder at her lovely face, then he sank on his knees beside her and kissed her as she lay asleep. Instantly, the spell was broken. The king and queen awoke, and all the courtiers with them. The horses neighed in the stables, and shook their glossy manes. The pigeons cooed upon the roof. The flies on the wall moved again, the fire burned up brightly, and the meat in the kitchen began to frizzle once more as the spit turned round. The cook gave the kitchen boy the tremendous box on the ear that she had started to give him a hundred years ago and everything and everybody went on just as usual, as if nothing at all out of the common had occurred. And up in the tower chamber, the princess opened her eyes to meet the gaze of the prince, who had dared to risk his life for her sake. What they said to each other nobody quite knows, for nobody was there to hear or see. But whatever it was, it must have been something very satisfactory, for very soon after they were married and lived happily ever after. The Cinderella There was once a rich man whose wife died, leaving him with one little girl. After some years, hoping to give his child a mother's love and care, he married again with a widow with two grown-up daughters. But his second wife was haughty and proud, and her two daughters were even worse than their mother, and the poor little girl had a very unhappy time with her new relations. Her stepsisters were jealous of her, for she was very beautiful, and they themselves were plain and ugly. They did all they could to make her miserable, and at length, through their wicked spite and envy, her life became a burden to her. The poor child was sent to live in the kitchen, where she had to do all the rough and dirty work, and because she was always dressed in rags, and sat beside the cinders in the grate, they called her Cinderella. It happened that the king of the country had an only son. He was very anxious that the prince should be married, so he gave a great ball, and invited all the grand ladies in the country to come to it. It was to be a very splendid affair, lasting for three nights, and people were very eager to be invited to it for it was known that the prince would choose his bride from among the ladies present. Cinderella's sisters received invitations. And from the day they arrived they talked of nothing but of what they should wear, for each of them secretly hoped that she would be chosen as the prince's bride. When the great day came at last, they began to dress for the ball directly after breakfast. Cinderella had to help them, and they kept her busy all day doing their hair, and running messages and helping them to lace up their fine dresses. When Cinderella saw their beautiful clothes, she wished that she could go to the ball as well, but when she timidly asked if she might, they laughed in mocking scorn. You go to the ball? What would you do at the ball with your rags and tatters and your dirty face? No, no, Cinderella, go back to your seat amongst the ashes. That is the place for a little kitchen girl like you. 
So the two sisters and their mother drove away in a carriage and pair to the king's palace, and Cinderella was left behind. She sat down on the hearth before the kitchen fire and began to cry softly to herself, because she felt very lonely and miserable. As she sat there in the dusk, with the firelight dancing over her, and her face buried in her hands, she heard a voice calling. Cinderella. Cinderella. And with a start she looked up to see who it could be. There on the hearth in front of her stood an old woman, leaning upon a stick. She was dressed in a long red cloak, and she wore high-heeled shoes and a tall black hat. Where she had come from Cinderella could not imagine. She certainly had not come in through the door, nor yet through the window for both were shut. Cinderella was so surprised to see her that she stopped crying, and stared at her in astonishment. What are you crying for? Asked the old woman. Because my mother and sisters have gone to the ball, and I am left here all alone. Said Cinderella. Do you want to go to the ball too? Said the old lady. Yes, but it is no good, I have nothing but wax to wear. Sobbed poor Cinderella. Well, well, be a good child and don't cry anymore. Said the old woman briskly. I am your fairy godmother, and if you do what I tell you, perhaps you shall go after all. Run out into the garden and bring me in a pumpkin. Cinderella ran out into the garden and brought in the biggest pumpkin that she could find. Now go and fetch the mousetrap out of the cellar. Said her godmother, and Cinderella hurried to get it. There were six mice in the trap, and the old woman harnessed them to the pumpkin, put a rat on the top to drive them, and two lizards behind, and then waved her wand over them. Immediately, the pumpkin turned into a gorgeous coach, the mice into six beautiful horses, the rat into a stately coachman, and the lizards into tall footmen, with powdered hair and silk stockings. There. Said the old woman. There's a carriage to take you to the ball. Wow. But how can I go to the ball? I have nothing to wear but this. Said Cinderella as she touched her ragged frock. Is that all? Said the fairy godmother. Once more she waved her wand, and Cinderella's rags turned into the most beautiful dress in the world all shining with gold and silver threads and covered with costly gems. In her hair was a circlet of pearls, and her feet were shod with the prettiest and daintiest pair of glass shoes that were ever seen. Now you can go to the ball. But mind you come away before the clock strikes twelve, for should you linger beyond that hour, your entire splendor will vanish, and your dress will turn into rags again. Said the fairy godmother. Cinderella promised to obey her godmother's instructions. Then she got into the beautiful coach. The footman shut the door, the coachman whipped up the horses and away she went to the ball. When she arrived there was a great stir in the palace. Nobody had ever seen such a lovely face or such a costly and rich dress before, and everyone assumed it must be some great princess from faraway lands. All the courtiers and other guests stood back to let her pass, and when the prince caught sight of her he fell in love with her on the spot. He danced with her the whole evening, and people thought there was no doubt as to whom he would choose for his bride. But Cinderella, was enjoying herself so much that she completely forgot what her fairy godmother had said, until she heard the clock begin to strike twelve. She remembered that as soon as it stopped striking, all her fine clothes would turn to rags, so she jumped up and ran out of the room. The prince ran after her, trying to overtake her, and Cinderella in her fright ran so fast that she left one of her little glass shoes on the floor behind her. The prince stopped to pick it up, and this gave Cinderella time to escape, but she was only just in time. Just as she was crossing the palace yard, the clock finished striking, and immediately all her finery vanished, and there she was, dressed in her old ragged frock again. When the prince came out at the palace steps, he couldn't see any sign of the lovely princess. The guards at the gate told him that nobody at all had passed that way, 
except a little ragged kitchen maid, and the prince had to go back to the ball with only a little glass shoe, to remind him of the beautiful lady, with whom he was so desperately in love. The next day, the king sent out all his heralds with a proclamation, saying that the prince would marry the lady whose foot the shoe fitted. But though all the ladies in the land tried on the shoe, it wouldn't fit any of them. Their feet were all too big. At last the heralds came to the house where Cinderella lived. The eldest stepsister tried the slipper on first, but it was quite impossible for her to get her foot into it. For her great toe was too big. Then her mother urged. Be quick. If you become the prince's bride, you will always ride in a carriage. But the shoe would not fit her and finally she was obliged to hand it to her sister. But the other sister had no better luck. She tried it but her foot was much too long, and her heel stuck out behind. Then Cinderella cautiously came out from behind the door, where she had been hidden, and asked if she could try on the shoe. Her stepmother and sisters were very angry, and were about to drive her away with blows, but the herald stopped them. The prince, wishes every woman in the land to try on this shoe. He said, and asking Cinderella to sit on a chair, he knelt down and tried the shoe on her foot. And it fitted her exactly. While everyone stood and stared in astonishment, no sooner had she done so than her ragged frock changed into the beautiful ball dress again, and she stood up before them all, the beautiful lady with whom the prince had fallen in love at the ball. The prince was overjoyed to find her again, and they were married at once. The wicked sisters they were so jealous that they both turned green with envy. But Cinderella became more and more beautiful, and lived happily ever after with the prince. Thanks for watching the video. Please hit the like and subscribe for more.